And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Craig Cody all the way from Manhasset, New York. Where's Manhasset, New York? Is that a suburb of Brooklyn or Long Island? It's a suburb of uh, Queens. It's on Long Island, about 20 miles uh, as a crow flies to uh, Midtown Manhattan. I think it's so funny because everybody, you say, what's the biggest city in America? Everybody says, New York City. And there's actually nobody that lives in New York City. I've never met anyone who says I live in New York City. They say, I live... Do you live in New York City? No, I live in Brooklyn. No, I live in Queens. No, I live in Manhattan. I'm like, well, why do they even say New York City? Because I've never met anyone who says they live there. Craig Cody has been a certified public accountant for the past 17 years and is also a certified tax coach, business owner, and former New York City police officer. That's how I met him. He was arresting me in Central Park, but we'll just we'll just stop there. Craig belongs to a select group of tax practitioners throughout the United States who undergo extensive training and continuing education on various tax planning techniques and strategies to become as well as remain certified. With this organization, Craig has co-authored the Amazon best-selling book, Secrets of a Tax-Free Lifestyle, and recently wrote 10 Biggest Tax Mistakes That Cost Business Owners Thousands of Dollars. Well, I, I want to start with that. I, I have four boys, Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach. And I always say that I've written books before. I always say that writing a book is like having a kid. I mean, it's nine months. What was going on in your life and your journey that made you, first of all, how many kids did you have? I have three. Three. Would you agree that um, it took longer to write a book than it did the nine months to make a baby? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, you have to make it a priority. You have to make it a priority. So what was going on in your life and your journey that made you want to write a book? And and, and what and why should my homies uh, buy this book? What 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 are they gonna so, what are they gonna be educated on if they read this book? So the, the the best thing about it is the ten most expensive tax mistakes they don't have to buy. I'm going to give them that for free. Okay. So right, right now I, you mean? <laughs> yes, right now. They just oh. have to go to the website and um and they'll have it. So uh the so, first so book that, I wrote So that's your website which is Craig Cody and company. So your name's Craig Cody. So Craig Cody, C-O-D-Y and company. Dot com forward slash dentistry uncensored. Forward slash dentistry uncensored. So what, what's going to happen if they go to uh, uh, Craig Cody and company dot com forward slash dentistry uncensored? There will be a little blurb about the show and then we will, uh, there'll be a box to fill in uh, their name, address, and um, we will send them out a book. You're, gonna, you're just going to send them a book? Just going to send them a book. Nice. My gosh, nice. Ah. So, uh, so, and, so what are they going to learn when they read that book? They're going to learn about common things that uh, business owners as well as dentists make, expense, uh, tax expense, tax mistakes that they make that cost them a lot of money. That, you know, basically no rocket science there. Okay? It's just basic things that people fail to do, like failing to plan. You know, um, you know, on the internet, you see when they, they started the IRS, it was a one-page deal. Here's your income, and then I think it was a times 3%, and that's a tax show. And now there's people saying that the tax code is something like 60,000 pages. Is that true? Yeah, it's a big book. So, so why, um, why are taxes so complicated? Why, why, did it, why, why is it in this what, – whatever happened to just the good old days where here's what you make, here's the percent, here's what you owe? Why is there a 60,000-page tax code, and what do dentists need to know about that tax code? Well, the tax code is what it is because of government, and what does the government really run that they run efficiently, and there's always you know, special interest. So we don't even get to get into why, why it is what it is. We just figure what can we do to take advantage of all those little loopholes in there. So – what can dentists do? There's a whole bunch of things do, dentists could do. Number one, they could plan. Most, most Number one, they can what? Plan. plan. Most dentists and accountants, when you talk to them about tax planning, they say, okay, yeah, we're going to sit down in December, figure out how much we made, how much tax I'm going to pay, how much I've paid, and what, what kind of tax payment I need to make by January 15th. That's what they call tax planning. Okay. What we call tax planning is sitting down early in the year and figuring out what you're doing it, how you're doing it. What ways can you maybe do it differently and save some taxes? I think one of the um, first areas I want to start on, that which I think is cruel and unusual, these dentists hire these young kids out of school, and they, they simply don't want to pay the FICA matching. So they say, well, I'm going to hire you as an independent contractor, which an independent contractor was more set up for more like construction, like uh, I'm going to build a house, and I'm not a plumber. I'm going to bring 
Craig Codian, who's a plumber, and you bring in your own materials, your own instruments, you do the plumbing, then I get an electrician, I get a roofer. But when you are not an independent contractor, when you get a job at a dental office and you're using the dentist is setting the hours, you're using all their tools and equipment, all that, but since they don't want to do FICA matching, they pay him an independent contractor. Then this dentist thinks he's making all this money and he's going out to eat and he's drinking and he's going to Disneyland. And he's having all this fun and he's not setting aside any quarterly or taxes or whatever. Then he meets with his accountant and the accountant says, you owe the IRS $40,000 in two weeks. And he's like, $40,000? I, I, I don't have $400. Uh, what, do, what do you think of that? Do you think it's, a, do you think it's an unethical scam? When dentists hire other dentists as independent contractors? Well, if there's really a tough set of rules to be considered an independent contractor, and there's a lot of control issues that I would say most people that are working in a dentist dental practice aren't going to meet that criteria. So they really are employees. And for the dentist himself, you know, there's liability there that if the IRS comes back and says, no, these people are deemed employees. Now you got to come up with that 7.65 of uh, payroll taxes and anything else that's uh, involved as such as penalties. So that's a tough one to pass. Well, I think you should write an article or a column or a blog on that because uh, I know I've been doing this 30 years. I've met about three different times where some dentist hired an, a, a, an associate but paid him as an independent contractor, had no idea that this guy wouldn't pay in his taxes for five, six, seven years. And then when he finally got popped by the IRS, they knew he didn't have the money. So they went to his employer and made him pay all the back taxes, fines, and penalties. And these guys had to go out and get a mortgage on their house. And it's like, well, dude, you, that, you, it, was, it was not right to begin with. Well, Howard, you just gave me a great idea. I'm in the middle of writing my third book, which has to do with dentists and tax problems. And I'm going to add a chapter on that. Well, thanks. That's because... And these, these young kids, I mean, they come out of dental school. They don't know anything about setting aside a tax savings account and working with a CPA and all that stuff. So that, that's my next question. So people that listen to podcasters, they're, they're 30 and under. Uh, people that are old and have grandchildren like me, do you have any grandchildren yet? No, no, no. Okay, not so you're still, you're still young. I, I, got, I got two grandkids. Um, a lot of these young kids, they come out of dental school, they got so much going on. They, they know they got to get disability insurance to get a job. But when should they get a CPA? Because most of, most of the people you're talking to right now are under 30. And my, my, my show's mostly, probably 20% are dental students and the other 80% are under 30. When should they get a CPA after they graduate from dental school? As soon as, soon as they start working, actually before they start working. You know, it doesn't have to be a very costly expense, okay? And I like to tell people... Your CPA is really an income item, not, a, not an expense item, because if you work with him and you do the proper planning, he's going to save you money. And now, what if she's in um, Oklahoma and you're in uh, New York City? Uh, do, you, do you take clients outside of New York City? We have clients all over the country. You know, Luckily, I have a network of people all over the country where we could brush up on the individual state rules. Um, but yeah, we work with people all over the country. So you were going over that top 10. The first one is to plan. And most uh, young dentists, uh, they, um, they learn real fast that the, uh, whenever they see that they actually have money piling up in their savings account, that only means one thing. Uh, it's time to pay taxes. So they don't have a plan. They just, uh, they just know that whenever they do have money in the savings account, it's all owed to the IRS. So, so when they come out of school, they should go to Craig Cody and company.com and you can do, help their planning their accounting. Uh, what about my homies in Canada? Do you do Canada? No, we don't do Canada. No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, that's just one more reason those Canadians should move south of the border. You know, 90% of Canadians live within a hundred miles of the border. So maybe this will be the last straw. They'll just move down 90 miles and they'll just, they'll just be America. Um, if we just raised our border 100 miles, we'd add a, a complete another California, another $38 million and a huge economy. Um, so what was on your 10? So go through the 10. What's, uh, what's two? I would say poor communication, which is kind of failing to plan, but it's just not, not communicating. It's a two-way street. You know, doctor doesn't call you up and say, how are you feeling today? Right? You need to communicate with him. So that's number two. Another thing we see, and this is really more in the practice owner side, it, or when you're younger dentists, when they buy practices, it's amazing how many times we see where they bought this practice and 
you're familiar with Goodwill because you, you've been involved in dentistry for a long time. They have this Goodwill on the books, which is for the layman out there, it's the difference between the assets you've purchased and the purchase price. And that gets amortized over 15 years. And so many times we see it is just sitting there. Nobody's ever taken that expense, which could be, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. That's um, it's amortization and then depreciation of leasehold improvements. Whether it was it done right? Um, and the, the good thing about that is when you find those errors, you could actually go back and recalculate it and take it in one year. OK, one of the problems, though, is uh... Um, how long how long have you been doing accounting? Because you were a, a police officer for what, uh, 33 years? <laughs> yeah, I wish. I, I retired as a, a New York City police lieutenant about 17 years ago. And how long were you with them? 17 years. Oh, you were with them 17 years. And I'm, I'm retired 17 years. Huh, oh, oh, okay, I see. <laughs> um, so you just used two words I know I know the kids don't know. They, they don't know the difference between depreciation and amortization. In fact... In fact, they see all these. They always see EBITDA, in, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. Will you, before you keep going, we need to back up and do vocabulary words. What is amortization? What is depreciation? What is EBITDA? Okay, so depreciation is when you buy an asset like a piece of equipment. The government says you could deduct that either all at once or over a certain period of time. That's depreciation. Amortization is very similar to depreciation. It's for that goodwill that when you buy a practice that there's actually nothing there to touch, okay? But it's the difference between the assets you bought and what you paid. And that gets deducted, it's called amortized, over 15 years. And so often we see it just sitting there, nobody's ever amortized it. And then um, the last was uh, earning EBITDA, earnings before interest, depreciation, and taxes, which, you know, that we see more when somebody's going to sell a practice all right. Um, we look at net profit with the practices that we work with um, and figure out ways where they could, you know, keep more of what they make and maybe not necessarily increase the net profit. But there are things that they can be doing and deducting that they're not. So, so they're actually putting more cash in their pocket. So EBITDA is E-B-I-T-D-A, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, is a measure of a company's operating performance. Essentially, it's a way to evaluate a company's performance without having to factor in financial decisions, accounting decisions, or tax environments. So, so, what, so number one was the plan, two was poor communication, three was depreciation. So you amortization? Got, that was okay. amort depreciation amortization. and amortization. Was that three okay. and four? That was three and four. So we're at five. Those, What's five? Five. Mistakes. Oh, God. Oh. Missing a home office. Okay. Um, let's just say you, you're a young dentist. You're new in a practice. You own your practice. and Or you're being paid on a 1099, which you probably shouldn't be. And you're doing all your administrative work from home. Okay. The government says you could take a home office deduction. So let's just say that room that you use only for your business is 10% of the square footage of your home. You can now write off 10% of your home expenses, such as your utilities, your maintenance. You could even do your real estate taxes and your mortgage interest. And people say, well, that doesn't really help. It does help when it comes to alternative minimum tax. And the other thing that allows you to do is it allows you, if you have a gym in your home, to write that off as a home athletic facility. If you have a pool, it allows you to write that pool off as a home athletic facility, as long as it's available for your employees and their families. And if you're an employee, it's you. Um, so that's the home office. Home office also allows you to deduct the travel expense between your home and your primary place of employment or your multiple places of employment. So those are things that, and they all add up. So probably if you're listening to this and you're 25 to 30 and you're working, uh, for corporate dentistry or you're an associate some office, you're, they're always wondering in the back of their head, gosh, you know, I'm paid a straight employee. If I owned a practice, I'd have a lot more taxable things I could do. Uh, I'd, I'd have more deductions. So if, if, if she's sitting in her car right now and she's thinking this question, uh, Craig, if I actually own my practice, how much more deductions would I get than my current situation where I'm an employee? A whole lot more. A whole lot more. Would that be enough? to make you swing from being an employee dentist as an associate to being a dentist practice owner? 
knowing Most what definitely. you know about the tax code, would that, would that sway yes. you from being an employee to an owner? Most definitely. And that's the reward the government gives you for going out there and taking those risks. Right. Okay, so continue. you got 10. You've done five. Another big one is choosing the wrong business entity. How are you operating? You know, did you just decide to open this business or buy this practice and went to your attorney and he said, okay, form an LLC or form a corporation, you know, what thought went into it? And sometimes it can make a big difference as far as the taxes you pay, whether you're an LLC, you're a sole proprietor, okay, you're a corporation or an S corporation. And um, fortunately, if you do choose the wrong entity, a lot of times there are opportunities to make what we call late elections in my world. And change the way that entity itself is taxed. So that's a, that's a big one. So who, who should make that decision? Is that, um, is that a CPA like you, or is that a lawyer? Uh, who, who usually makes that, that decision? Ultimately, in the, in the, best, the best case scenario is have the business owner, the attorney and the CPA have a conversation about that and choose what, what works out best. Because obviously you want the liability protection, um, but you also want the best tax, you know, tax way to go. Okay. So fortunately, um, we can make some changes there a lot of times and uh, make the correction without jumping through a whole lot of hoops. All right, so what's seven, eight, nine, and 10? So we got, let's see, we have taken the wrong, wrong retirement plan, you know, or no retirement plan. So um, I, I, sometimes they're taking a, they're using a SEP. Sometimes uh, they have a, a 401k. Sometimes they have no plan at all. And, you know, these days, you know, it's, it's a great way to attract good employees because they want a retirement plan. Um, 401ks are easy to set up. They're not going to cost you a lot of money. You can figure all that out in advance. And uh, a young dentist can put away $18,000 a year. So that's, that's one. Um, Another another thing, depending on the type of entity, um, there's something called the medical expense reimbursement plan that you can have where, depending on how you're set up, you could write off all those out-of-pocket uh, medical expenses that normally are not deductible. We have um, hiring your family, okay? The court actually says, uh, Supreme Court ruled you can hire somebody as young as seven years old to work in your business. Now, I'm a bit conservative, so I like to start at 11 or 12. And let's just say, let's just say little Johnny, little Johnny's going to private high school and it's costing you $500 a month. So if you pay that out of your pocket, you don't get any deduction for it. But if you have Johnny come in and he works a couple hours on Saturday, maybe a couple hours during the week, you pay him, it goes into his bank account and you get a deduction for that. And then the school drafts his checking or savings account every month for the $500. You just turn that expense into a deduction. Now, one kid is six thousand. Three kids is eighteen thousand. I, I think the um, minimum wage law and the, the not working at sixteen. I, I, I think it's the most cruelest thing ever. Um, I, I I go back to my childhood. Everybody like my dad who owned a restaurant. You know, I, I worked there since I was ten. My best friend John Lease worked there um, since he was ten, and now we're both dentists. And we thought school was boring, and we thought working at Sonic Drive-in evenings and weekends was the most fun of our life. But you're with adults, you're with managers, you're with employees, you're with customers, you're making change. And, and to sit there and same thing if your dad was a dairy farmer, um, he hired you and your buddies and they were baling hay. And you always had jobs and you always had income. And then those poor kids who maybe they're single family, uh, maybe it's just your mom and, uh, and uh, she doesn't own her own business. And you come home from school and you're, you're not allowed to work from age 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So what do they do? They, they get bored. They get into trouble. They start smoking pot, whatever the hell. I, if you think it is absolutely uh, criminal that a 14-year-old kid after high school got a job at Subway, you're, you're just, you're, you're insane. I, I think the, uh, the smartest business people that come out of dental school and the, and the dentists who do the most successful, their parents either owned a dental office owned a farm, owned a business. The kids I worry about the most was the mom and dad were employees and they just, they walk out of school and they don't have the first inkling of an idea, the culture of what it means to own your own business. And, and to not want to share that with a kid is criminal. Right. It's a, it's a great learning experience. And, you know, I mean, I think back to my time, I mean, 10 years old, we, where I was, you had a bicycle and you, you had a paper route. Okay. 
now you wouldn't let your kid out at six o'clock in the morning on a bike riding around the corner. You know, so th- times have changed and there are no jobs out there, unfortunately, for kids, you know, so it, it's tough. But hiring your kids and hiring, you know, relatives is a great way to do it. And you can make certain things and not deductible. You could actually turn them into deductible expenses. What number was that? Was that eight? That was probably, let's just say it was eight. Let's talk about um, what well, we talked about, missing car and truck expenses, um, missing meals and entertainment. Are you taking people out? Are you entertaining them? Okay. Um, that's 50% deductible. Or are you providing meals in office for your staff? If you're doing it under certain circumstances, you, you can deduct the whole cost of the meals and entertainment. Uh, there's uh, another one we'll go. We'll go to n- a number 11, which isn't in my book. Um, how about... The ability to rent your home to your business for up to 14 days a year and not have to pay income tax on that money. So your business writes off the expense and you don't have to pay income tax on that. So basically, if you're 25 and you just got a dental score, you're in dental school. What, what this basically means is, so let's, let's say you have two credit cards. Let, let's say you have a Chase uh, Visa card, a debit card, and you have an American Express. If you pull money out of your, um, if you pull money out of your business and you pay tax on it, or you're an associate, and the money you get, you pay taxes on. Well, let's say you, the average person paid 38% taxes. But if you use your American Express, and this is a business expense, I'm going out to dinner because it's with clients, dentists, whatever, and I use the American Express, I didn't have to, at that money, it's basically everything's 38% off. So if you Half use your that. debit card, you already paid 38% on the money that you bought the dinner with. But if you use your American Express card, it's 38% off if it's a business expense. Is that, a, is that a succinct, fair way to describe it? Yes, half of it is a 38% deduction because you, the government says you were going to eat anyway, but the people you're entertaining, you know, you weren't going to pay for their meals, and you are. So you get to deduct that, and you're saving 38% on that. And this is the business owner. Unfortunately, it really doesn't work for the employee. So what are, would you say, if someone said, what are the three biggest tax mistakes dentists make that lose them thousands, what would you say? Back to failing to plan, amortization and depreciation, I, not to, you know, beat a dead horse, but that. And um, another one we didn't talk about is, you know, for the, the dent, we're talking about the dentist in practice, the dent, you know, setting up a management company to, you know, manage the different things that he has going on at different businesses. You know, so let's just say you're in a 40 percent or the 33 percent tax bracket federally. Uh, you set up a management company and. You know, the spread between the first 50000 in net income and your 43% is about 28%, and you're saving, you know, $14,000 a year. Nice. And, you could, and then you use that money to invest in other, other pieces of real estate or business or, you know, or just invest it in the market. So this is what you're talking about where um, number one problem was they don't plan. They need to be proactive. They need to uh, talk to their CPA and set up proactive tax plan strategies as opposed to um, getting caught up in the news and finding out that your taxes are due April 15th and you only got, so this weekend you got to you gotta set aside some time this weekend to hurry up and get your taxes done or you fly down to, uh, or you run down to the corner, uh, what, what is that, H&R Block? You know, I went to dental school in Kansas City. That, that's where H&R Block was from. And the, the founder of that had this uh, beautiful home out there in uh, on the way to Johnson County, but uh, but yeah. So what you're saying is, you know, if you're going to wait to the last minute to go to H and R Block and file your taxes, then you're not going to have a lot of proactive strategy that you thought about in advance. You're strictly going to be looking in the rearview mirror, and the idea is to look forward and keep more of what you make. Yeah. By the way, what would your uh, what would your tax advice be? If, if, what, what would you say if she comes out of school and says, look, I'm $500,000 in debt and you used to be a New York City police officer. How much debt would they have to have before as a police officer you recommend they just flee to Canada or Brazil <laughs> or Australia and uh, just say adios? I, I don't know if there's enough debt to make me flee the country. <laughs> uh so what, what's more stressful, being a police officer or the or being afraid of criminals or being afraid of the IRS? I think if you ask the general person, uh, being afraid of the IRS. Nobody likes to get a letter from the IRS. Yeah. So what was it like being a New York City police officer 17 years? Oh, it was great. I had a great run. I made a lot of uh, great friends. Uh, my son is actually a third-generation police officer right now. 
Um, and I, I had a great run. I, you know, it was a great experience. I learned to deal with the people of all walks of life, you know, and, um, you know, it was, it was a good 17 years. It was time to move on, but it was a good 17 years. So what, what was going on in your journey? I mean, police officer to CPA, that, that's not a very common journey. I think you're no. the only one I know. You're the it's only not one a I common... know that went from police to CPA. How, how did that work out? Most go from police to attorneys. Mine was a little different. Uh, you know, when I was when I first came on, I was young, right out of the college. You know, I said, uh, if I can make fifty thousand dollars a year by the time I retire, I'll be set for life. Okay. <laughs> I used to go back to college where my friends were and you know live for the weekend on ten dollars. So um, I was going to be. My goal was I was going to you know uh, move up the ranks, become a chief, and um, it's civil service. And I had a way to, I was promoted relatively early. I was a sergeant and I waited 10 years to be promoted to, to actually to be able to take an exam to be promoted to lieutenant. And uh, I kind of figured during that time, I wanted to have more control over what I do and my life and my income. So I went back to school and uh, I got my degree. And then when I retired, I went to work for an international firm for a number of years, got some good experience and, you know, slowly went out on my own. And, uh, wow. So, so you say it's actually common for policemen to turn into lawyers? Oh, it's very common. Very common. Really? At least, I mean, the, the, you know, I come from a police department that had 35,000, you know, members. 35,000? So, what was it, that Manhattan or Brooklyn or Queens? Uh, or? All, all of New York City, all five boroughs. Oh, okay. So that's, that's the only time New York City comes into play. Exactly. if it's the police department. Yes. <laughs> and you know where the word cops comes from? Copper. They used to have a copper badge. That's right. And, and it's the emblem of the New York Yankees, right? Uh, they have the NY. They have the NY. Yeah, I learned that on Ellis Island, that the, the original police officer's badge. And, but the, the, the badge they showed, it looked like the Yankees logo. Maybe. I, I don't think I've ever seen the original. It's been a long time. Well, since the, one, the one on Ellis Island, uh, I mean, I, I'm not a logo expert, but it looked pretty much like the New York Yankees. And they were made out of copper, so that's where the name came from. I yeah. love word origination, um, but uh, so so yeah. But I gotta tell you, growing up in Kansas, you know the Wichita, Kansas, the tallest things, you know, a grain silo. I'll never ever forget my entire life. The first time I went to New York City, I was with a classmate of mine, Craig Steichen. And if you grow up in Kansas, the first time you see New York City, that is the most shocking. St I mean, just t it took my breath away when I was looking out the window, and I finally realized that that thing up there was a canyon of buildings and we went there the funniest thing was Craig and I went he's a dentist in Albuquerque and we went there we threw our luggage on the bed we're at the Sheridan in Manhattan and we ran downstairs and we started walking down the street and the next thing I said to Craig I said I don't know why but my feet actually are hurting I, I wonder what's going on and he goes well dude it's three in the morning we've been walking crazy for six hours I mean that's you walk for six hours that's a marathon and right. uh, we could not believe it was three in the morning. I mean, we were, that was that exciting. I mean, just <laughs> next block, next block, next block. I mean, it was just, God, Manhattan is just the coolest thing. And I also love the statistic. Did you know that if all seven and a half billion earthlings lived at the same density as Manhattan, we would all fit on New Zealand? Wow. Wow. That's interesting. So did you learn anything being a police officer that you applied to accounting? Yeah, I learned how to communicate with people, which was, you know, that's a, it's all about communication. And I learned how to communicate. I was lucky. I did a lot of interesting things. I worked in, you know, impoverished area. I worked in Midtown. And you learn, you, you, need, you need to treat everybody right. And that comes into play when you're dealing with your employees. And you learn just how to communicate with people. So it was a great experience. And what percent of everyone um, you ever arrested, um, at the end of the day, it all had to do because they were drinking too much in Manhattan. <laughs> uh, probably not a whole lot. Okay. Really? Really yeah, not a whole no, lot? Not a whole lot. No, no. You know, back, you know, back in the day, which was probably when you were walking around midtown Manhattan, you know, I had a foot post and between 7th Avenue and 8th Avenue, there were six of us on one side of the street and there were six of us on the other side of the street. That's how crazy it was back in that time. You know, now, now you walk down Times Square and it's beautiful. But, you know, crime was rampant back in those days, you know, um, but alcohol definitely, you know, fuels family disputes and, you know, people doing stupid things. Because whenever you see those cop shows, it seems like it seems like almost all of them are drunk or drunk or stoned. It's, it, I mean, it's like it's, most of the stuff that's on those uh, cop TV shows, 
isn't anything you'd ever do sober. Right. And it, a lot of it is family disputes. Yeah. So that's what you and, see on and TV. And what percent of the family disputes are, um, have alcohol involved? Probably 95% of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so I want to go back to terminology because th these kids have been studying algebra, geometry, trig, and the periodic table. Um, what is the difference between a CPA and a CFO? So a, a CFO is a chief financial officer. Okay. I, and that's one of, we actually offer that service to certain clients. Um, that's a, you, you don't have to be a CPA to be a CFO. Um, we offer that service because when we have a, a client that has a bigger practice or multiple practices or multiple businesses, instead of hiring a CFO at, you know, some crazy number, he could hire us at a much reasonable number with the advent of the internet. Um, it's just like you're in a room next door and you could co provide, you know, cost effective, really efficient services. And how often should a dentist actually talk to their CPA? At least monthly. Really? At and what least percent monthly. of the dentists you think talk to their CPA monthly? Less than 5%. Yeah. But you really think once a month the, the dentist should call their CPA and say, yeah. what up, Craig? What, whether it, it doesn't have to be a phone call. It could be email back and forth, okay? Some kind of communication, yeah, because there's always things going on, and you don't know what you don't know. You know, people go and they do things, or they're going to do things, and if, if you don't communicate with them, you don't know what they're doing. They may be doing it wrong, and you help them do it the right way. So, uh, you know, we, we have a staff of 10, and we communicate with all clients on a regular basis. You have to. My dad, uh, I have so many amazing memories of my father, but he used to always sing me a jingle. He had so many one-liners that he'd sing to me. And he had this way of singing, uh, you know what it is on an accounting? It, it basically, my, my dad went to mass every single morning until the day he died, but he cussed like a sailor. But anyway, <laughs> he's uh, it was kind of a weird morality thing. Um, he always say the easiest dollar earned is a dollar in in. A, the easiest dollar earned is a dollar saved. The second easiest dollar earned is a dollar taxes delayed. The hardest damn blankety blank blankety blank dollar you'll ever earn is to do another dollar in sales. And so the the, the easiest dollar earned is a dollar expenses saved. The second easiest dollar earned is a dollar tax delayed. The hardest dollar you'll ever earn is to try to get another sell. So my dad, I mean one of my earliest memories of my father. I was working at his restaurant at Sonic Drive-In, and um, I put four pickles on the hamburger. And he walked by, and he picked up those four hamburger, th these four pickles on, and he threw the thing on the wall. He said, "Jimmy Christmas, Howard, if you're gonna put four pickles on it, you might as well just, um, you might as well just lose money on the. What do you say? You might as well give the thing away for free." He goes, "It's three pickles. It's never four. And then he was telling me that you know if, if we put on four pickles on every sandwich, or pickle costs to go up 25 percent we don't have that kind of margin i mean they they were fanatics on cutting costs i mean when you're when you're selling a hamburger fry and a coke that's what dentists don't understand i mean when mcdonald's selling a hamburger fry and a coke they, they gotta make money off three bucks that dentist doesn't even sell anything in his office that costs under 20 i mean what, what's the cheapest thing you could buy in a dental office one x-ray or one tooth and then they'd still ding you for an exam I mean, dentists just don't know. Like the average grocery store has a 1% profit margin and the average S&P 500 publicly traded in your town at, at NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, the average is a 5% profit margin. And then you go into a dental office and this guy's supplies and lab is 18% and then the guy in the next building over is 13%. The variance of just that one cost is 5%, which is the average profit margin for the entire S&P 500. I mean, dentists, not only do they not know their costs, they don't even know the beginning of cost cutting. But the second thing after cost cutting is a dollar in taxes delayed. So when my dad was singing me that song, the easiest dollar earned is a dollar in expenses saved. The second easiest dollar earned, a dollar in taxes delayed. That, that's where you come in as a, a certified tax ghost, right? Are you, tell them what's the difference between a tax deduction and a tax delay. Well, a, a tax deduction is something you get immediately. A tax delay is such as your, the money you put into your retirement account. You put that money away today. You don't pay tax on it today. 
in 30 years when you take it out, you start paying tax on it then. Okay? So that's what a tax delay is. So uh, another thing you could do, you, you know, equipment you might want to call tax delay, all right, because you get to depreciate it, but probably retirement plans are one of the biggest tax delays. Sorry. So what do you think of some of these, uh, every once in a while you'll see a dentist on uh, Dental Town doing something like um, December 31st, they'll go by, like, like they'll go to Henry Schein, which is uh, in uh, Amherst, New York. Uh, is it Amherst? Yeah. In Henry Schein, that's the largest dental company in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Stan Bergman. Um, they'll, they'll, go to, they'll go to Henry Schein and say, I'm going to buy all my supplies for next year today. And I want to pay for it on the 31st because I want to ding my uh, overhead now to pay last taxes. What, what do you, what do, you do, you, do any of your clients ever do crazy stuff like that? Or is that a little too outrageous? Or what, what are your thoughts on well, that? Well, here's, here's the thing. If you do that and you get caught, you know, supplies you're supposed to write off as you, as you use them. So it's really inventory. So if you ever get audited and you have a $50,000 supply bill on December 30th, they're going to disallow that deduction. So there are other ways to go about it, proper planning, okay? Or, or buy a piece of equipment. If you need a piece of equipment, that's, that's allowable. But the supplies doesn't pass. And I actually saw Bergman. He was the keynote speaker at my daughter's uh, college graduation a few weeks ago, and he was great. Yeah, I love Stan. Uh, he's, uh, he's an amazing man. You know, what, you know what I love most about Stan? Forget about Henry Schein. Forget about everything he's ever done twice in my life. I've gone on a missionary dental trip. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, jungle, four-wheel drives, no roads, wondering if the, the, these people even know what they're doing, if we're going to be safe or whatever. And then all of a sudden, there's this beautiful dental office in the middle of nowhere that looks just like a, the finest one in Manhattan. And you go in there, and there's 10, 12 brand-new chairs, blah, 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 all donated by Henry Schein. And I got to tell you a funny story I did. I was in uh, Tanzania, and I um, was telling all these little beautiful children that my friend, Stan, he's actually actually did this. He, he's the one who, who paid for all this. And I thought they were understanding. So I said, so I pulled out my iPhone, and I put on video. I said, I want you all to tell my friend Stan thank you. So on three, everybody say thank you. And it's posted on YouTube. I go, one, two, three. And these 30 Tanzanian children that were probably all under 10, Start singing, happy birthday to Stan. <laughs> happy birthday. So I thought, okay, well, you know, that, that that's close enough. I don't speak a word of Tanzania, but they, they thought I was obviously saying, tell them happy birthday, not say thank you. But uh, Stan, that, that's just one hell of a man. And I, I both times I told him about that. And he, he just smiled. I mean, he does charity all day, every day, and doesn't tell anybody about it. I mean, he, and he's originally from South Africa. Uh, yeah, he's a, yeah. It was a really interesting speech, and I, I tell you, that's the best one. I, you know, that's the best one I've ever heard. Yeah. So, um, so easiest dollar earned, dollar expenses saved. Do you guide these guys on their expenses? I mean, do you do enough dentists where you can sit there and say, "Hey, look, Harry has less expenses than you." How many? How many, what percent of your practice is dentists? How many dentists do you do? Do you do enough dentists to actually give them some benchmark parameters? Well, we just started doing, uh, we added six new dentists recently, so we have 10, and we're actually in the process of uh, creating some benchmarks so we could go back now to them and see where they compare to their peers and where they should be able to cut some costs. So you do 10 dentists right now? Right. So after the show, you should be at 11. Yes. One of my homies better call you because here's what um, I, I think about that is the fact that, uh, you know, in 1900, there were no specialties. So the family doctor did your head to toe. And we obviously know how well that went. And by 2000, there were 58 specialties and just the dentist only just dentist doing the mouth. They had nine. And I tell people, if your CPA only does one dentist, how if, if, you, if you talk to your CPA and they hang up and they call a restaurant, a donut shop, and a dairy farmer, how, how are they going to add value? And I, I, you're, you're doing 10. I would say that's a great benchmark. If your CPA isn't doing at least 10 dentists, um, how do they know what to compare you to? Well, well that's, that's where it comes in. Um, you know, the value added is there where you can say, okay, this is what. It's kind of like being in a mastermind group. These are the expenses of the typical pediatric dentist. All right. 
which differ than the implant dentist. And this is where you should be. This is where you are. This is where your overhead is. This is where it really should be. And it gives you some guidance as to how to get there. So we started doing, um, looking at the P&Ls on a monthly basis, and now we're going to start comparing the P&Ls to, to benchmarks on a quarterly basis. Yeah, I, uh, I think that would be the saddest job in the whole world, to have to be a pediatric dentist listening to kids scream and cry all day long. <laughs> and what, that, they, they love it. I know. And, and you know what? I'll never forget, I was on a missionary dental trip in, um, um, Chi- it was either Chiapas or... Or no, it was Antioch. It was, it was Antioch. It was about an hour north of, um, of uh, what's that big um, New York City resort? Acapulco. It was an hour north of Acapulco. And there's like 20 kids from AT Still. And, you know, they, they, they line up, you know, for forever. They, they line up all night long waiting to get in there. And these kids were just screaming. And, and you saw all these adults all stressed out of their mind. And then there was this one boy. And he's just sitting there like, like. Yeah, just like hi, and he's smiling, and and I, I watched him the whole time, and it's like for a week, this this guy never was stressed with a crying child, and I told him, I said, dude, you don't you, you don't know what I'm seeing here, but you you got to be a pediatric dentist because this does not phase you. You are just hardwired at birth to be a pediatric dentist. He goes, <laughs> yeah, I like working on kids, and it, it doesn't stress me. And I'm like, well, everyone else is stressed out of their mind, and you're just sitting here. Uh, you're either drunk, stoned. Or should be a pediatric dentist, and uh, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, so what else should they know? What else should they know? Um, watch your expenses, okay? Um, you know, it's it's amazing how many times you see, and not just dentists and any business owners, they're not watching their expenses, and then, you know, money's disappearing. It's easy, and and it, sometimes it's legitimately disappearing because when cash is good. Um, and it's flowing, you spend money on everything, all right? Save some money, pay down the debt, come up with a plan to pay down the debt. If you could pay it faster, that's great. Um, but just if they know to communicate and they're working with somebody who will communicate with them, that's they're way ahead of the game. Um, like I said, most, denti- uh, most CPAs are good at putting the right numbers in the right boxes, but it kind of ends there. You, you want to really communicate and see, you know, get some value. Get some value. Otherwise, I want to ask, you, I ask you some uh, um, common questions. One, one of the most common questions they ask on Dental Town under uh, accounting and all that is, uh, should I lease or buy my car? That is a very common question. So let's let's just say you're, you're going to be driving, you know, a reasonable amount of distance and you're not going to go over your mileage. So and you're using it 100 percent for business, let's just say. So if you're going to buy a car, you get to depreciate it over a period of time, and the first year's depreciation is maxed out at about $2,500. If you lease that vehicle, you're typically going to get a bigger deduction every year versus purchasing it. So, um, And if you're somebody like me that doesn't know how to fix a car and doesn't want to deal with fixing a car and you'd rather be in something new every three years, you know, from a lifestyle perspective, it's you're better off leasing. But you're going to have a payment forever. So Dental Town has 50 categories. And by the way, if you kids getting out of dental school, if, if you had told me 30 years ago when I got out of dental school, someday I'd have an iPhone in my pocket and there'd be this app called Dental Town with a quarter million dentists living in my pocket, I would have thought that was something I've seen out of Star Wars. But, you know, the categories like root canals, fillings, crowns. So one is finance. And then you open finance. There's either equipment, acquisition, and practice expansion financing patient finance plans, personal finance, or taxes. So um, so do you consider yourself more, um, as a CPA, is that more personal finance or taxes? It's a mixture of both because, you know, if you're able to keep more of what you make, you have more things that you could play with in your life to save or, or invest in things. So it, it's a combination, personal finance and or taxes. What other questions do you think young dental students that just got out of school would want to know about uh, um, taxes oh. and personal finance? Well, we, we get a lot of questions, you know, should we pay down, you know, our student loans? Should we pay down our practice debt? Um, how do we save for new equipment? What's the best way to go about, you know, we want to 
purchase you know another piece of equipment next year and it's going to cost us one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. What's the best way to save for it? And and you know if we save ninety thousand dollars this year, we're going to have it in the bank, but we have to pay tax on it. How do we? Is there a way to do it where we could get a deduction for that money? So. That, those are big questions we get from you know people that are already in business and they're, they're young, but they're growing and they want to do things the right way, that they're not getting those answers from anyone else. Okay, but if she's setting up a de novo practice, she's already found a place, she's going to rent 2,000 square feet, she's looking at all that stuff, but if she starts setting this up, would you recommend Quicken? Would it be QuickBooks Desktop? Would it be QuickBooks Online? What, what, what accounting package do you think she should go with? So when we work with a client, we do all their, you know, what I'll call write-up work, which is the accounting part of it, all right? Um, I think a dentist is better off spending his or her time in their practice doing what they need to do. If they want to enter, we allow them to enter checks and stuff like that into, you know, our system. But um, Quip, my personal favorite is QuickBooks. I think QuickBooks Online is unfortunately, it's a horror show. It doesn't have the functionality that the regular QuickBooks has. Um, and I, I don't think a dentist should be doing their own books. You know, I'm so glad you said it because when, when I when I hear people say, "Oh, Quicken Online is that that's awesome," it's like, okay, dude, you just basically told everyone in the room you have no idea what you're talking about. I use, um, you know, I have an MBA. I've been doing this 30 years. I have um, a two person, two bookkeepers, but we use QuickBooks. I mean, we we use Peachtree. Okay. Is um. Is, do, do you have any clients that use Peachtree? Do you, what do you think about Peachtree? I've used Peachtree. You know, it's just, I don't think there's much of a big difference between QuickBooks and Peachtree. Um, we don't have any clients on Peachtree. It's been a long time since I've worked with Peachtree. But honestly, it's just a matter of being comfortable with it. That I don't think there's a big difference. But, you know, QuickBooks is the 200-pound gorilla. And Microsoft bought Great Plains Accounting. Well, yeah. why, why, do you, why do you think Microsoft bought Great Plains Accounting, and how would you compare Great Plains Accounting to, like, QuickBooks? Uh, it's Great Plains is, or I think there's a new name for it, is um, it's way ahead of, I think, anything that most dental practices are going to need, okay? Maybe if you have multiple offices and you want to be able to roll up all your financials into one, you'd use something like that. But that's not typically typical um practice software i would say well but there's but 12 percent of the market is dso's okay so so there's a lot of guys listening to you right now that might have 12 offices i i, I haven't come across anyone using great planes um in it in the dental field um but it, it's it is it's a it's a big cumbersome piece of software um and I just haven't had come across anybody that uses it. We have a we have a client that is in multiple countries that uses it. Um, it's cool, but um, now I the, haven't seen the need the for S and P five hundred. They all use S and what is it? SAP accounting out of a yes. software out of uh, Germany. Yes. So the so the Fortune five hundred uses the German SAP. Um, the thing that I was always mad at the most about Bill Clinton. Forget all of his. Uh, you know, I know he's supposed to never talk about. It religion, sex, and politics, but I mean, um, when he blocked Microsoft buying into it because Bill Gates wanted it to be Word, Excel, um, PowerPoint, and for a business, you got to have the accounting, and he tried to buy uh, into it, which owns uh, Quicken, and the, uh, Bill Clinton said that was monopolistic behavior, that everybody blocked it, and I just thought, man, there's all these small businesses where it would have been so nice if their Microsoft Office suite would have been merged with their accounting. And I just think how many more small businesses would have known their numbers and been better businessman and avoided, you know, there's 60,000 small business bankruptcies a year. And I just thought that was um, overreaching of the federal government to, to let him innovate with that software package. Yeah, as it, you know, integration would be a wonderful thing. You know, uh, it helps any business run, you know, more efficiently. Yeah. So is Great Plains still, it's, it's, not, you said it's not called Great Plains anymore? It's not called Great Plains. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, like I said, we have a client, they're an international client. They're in a mul multiple countries and they use it and we use it with them. Um, oh, it's called, um, change to Microsoft Dynamics. Dynamics. Yep. Dynamics. Over a decade ago. Huh. And, uh, 
Microsoft Dynamics. So you, so you think that's, uh, so would you, would you say that uh, SM, SM, SAP is for the Fortune 500, Quicken's more for just personal family and this uh, um, Microsoft Dynamics, maybe that's just for like a middle market company, maybe that's more $50, $100 million, what, what, what would you? Uh, yeah, I, I would say, you know, you're, you're definitely a bigger companies would be Microsoft Dynamics. Quicken, you know, Quicken has a couple of different, you know, variations. They have their enterprise version. So they have some robust software and rep reporting capabilities. But your, your average dentist, uh, even if he owns one or two practices, QuickBooks is fine. QuickBooks Online, I would stay away from. Um, Why? But uh, well, n number one, if you ever if you ever want to move data from QuickBooks Online to regular QuickBooks, up until at least last year, you weren't able to do it. You had to do it all manually, um, and they own your data. You know, I mean, they say you don't own it, but they they own your data. It's all there. So you have to get it out of there, um, and it doesn't have the robust features that regular QuickBooks has. You keep running re certain reports is not is not as easy. Um, you know, maybe I'm a little bit old school, but it, it I could do a lot more with regular QuickBooks or QuickBooks accountant version um, than I could with QuickBooks online. But Intuit does want you to move to online. That's what they wish. Okay, then I want to ask you the, the scary part. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm embarrassed to ask you this question, uh, but it's, it's true. This is a big fear. A lot of dentists always are worried that if they don't do all this themselves, they let their office manager help them or they let you input the checks, whatever, it's just going to set them up for embezzling. And that's why a lot of dentists say, I, I don't want my receptionist entering the checks. I don't want to do impair. I got to do everything myself because whoever helps me is going to steal. Right. Well, if you have somebody in your office that you trust, okay, and it doesn't mean that people have check writing privileges, okay? So we, we have access to a, a whole bunch of our clients' bank accounts, but it's called accountant's access. It's like read-only access. We can't write checks. We can't pay bills, all right? But if, if you're working with a good CPA and you, you have somebody in your office that you trust, and you, you actually look at your numbers occasionally, between your CPA and yourself, you should be able to spot things that are out of place, okay? So um, embezzlement happens, okay? But it typically happens when people aren't looking. You need to, you know, trust but verify. Um, what if one of my homies is listening to you right now and saying, um, I'm an associate, um, but if I called you up, do, do you help... Uh, is, is it pie in the sky to refinance all my student loans? A lot of, a lot of them are driving around thinking, you know, I, I got nine different student loans going back from undergrad, different government programs. I got, uh, sometimes they, they, they'll post on Dentaltown, should I go to the bank and uh, get one loan and pay off all my student loans or one payment? Other people are saying um, you should refinance. What, what, what's your thoughts on student loan refinance? I would say look at what, what, what it's going to do to your rate, what's it going to do to your overall interest cost over time, and make, it, make the decision that way. But do you, have you ever, would, if she called you, would you work with her on that? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we work with our clients on all sorts of, you know, finance. Needs. So it's not just about putting the numbers in the boxes, okay? It's a make, about making them more efficient and helping, give them the guidance that they need. So how, how, how do you like to be contacted? Website, email, phone number? E email, phone number, website, all of the above. Um, Give I'll, them out. Yep, okay. My phone number is 516-869-4051. Say email it again. Is say, say it again. 516-869-4051. My email, my email is craig at ccody cpa.com and the website is www.craigcodyandcompany.com so i gotta and tell you okay i gotta tell you a funny story about craig so uh my best friend in dental school was craig steichen that that's the guy in albuquerque that i went to new york city with the first time and my first boy was eric four letters and i said on the second boy i told my ex i wanted him to be named craig and she goes, no, it's five letters. I want all my boys to be four letters. It was Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach. So she changed Craig to Greg. So every <laughs> time I say Greg, and Greg knows that, doesn't he? So it's kind of funny when uh, Craig's over here and Greg says, uh, sorry, Greg, but you're actually named after Craig, but Craig was five letters, so that's why you're a Greg. And uh, so you're a CraigCodyandCompany.com, and you're a Craig at 
ccodycpa.com. And um, I'm just looking through this. God, there's so many questions. I, I'm sitting here debating whether I should ask you these questions or if you should just go to Dentaltown. And like I say, so on Dentaltown, we got 50 categories. You know, they start off with, uh, uh, well, the first one at the top is my private groups because a lot of people don't like to ask questions in front of everybody on Dentaltown. So a private group, what that is on Dentaltown is you can set up, anybody can set up their own private group, have all the functionality at Dentaltown, but anybody that wants to join your group has to get permission. And then if you don't like them, you can kick them out. Uh, there's just some people that don't want to ask the question in front of a quarter million people. Then it's like anesthesiology assistants, CAD CAM computers, um, you know, on and on and on, and then endodontics. Then we go to finance. And finance is equipment acquisition practice expansion financing. Next is patient finance plans, then personal finance, and then taxes. And there's just a gazillion uh, conversations and questions there. Um, yeah, so if you have questions for this, you can uh, email Craig at ccodycpa. Uh, you can post them on Dentaltown. Um, and also, uh, um, God, there's so many questions about th this one question this guy just posted. He said, well, what about QuickBooks Premier? Well, how would you answer that? Oh, Quick QuickBooks Premier is a version of QuickBooks. It's a, it's a, it's a good program, you know. If it's desktop. Yeah. But you don't like it on the cloud. I don't. I don't like the online ver. The online version is not. You could have the desktop version on the cloud, all right. But uh, the online version is QuickBooks Online. Um, it doesn't have the same functionality. And by the way, you know, here's the like. There's a big thread. Employee dentist versus independent contractor. So let's say you're 25. You just walked out of school, and you're getting a job as an associate. When people talk about associates, it's really easy to uh, anchor that to associates at the. 35 big corporate dental chains that have 50 or more locations. But the reality is 90% of all the associates just go work for some small dentist. So you walk in there and he says, no, I'm, I'm going to pay as an independent contractor. Well, then just pull out your damn smartphone, open up your dental town app, go to finance or go to the search bar and type in independent contractor and then sit there and so then say, look, read this thread, dude. I mean, I mean, it's it's not me. I mean, I'm 25. I just got out of dental school. Um, but it seems like all my homies say this is not true. This is not work. In fact, it's scary for you because if I work for you for three years, never pay my taxes, and the IRS found out that I didn't have a dime, they 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 give you the bill. That so, is scary. Um, yeah, that's really scary. My dad used to always say that uh he thought it was funny, he said, you know. He said, if you murdered someone, you go to trial, there'd be a jury of people. But he says, dude, when you go to the IRS court, there's no jury. It's just you, the IRS judge, and you're going to lose. Is that still true to this day, or do they have juries now? <laughs> no, they don't have juries. They, they don't, don't have, juries. have juries. They don't have juries. At least I've never been to a, 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 a jury. You know, you don't want to get and you don't want to get to that point. You don't isn't want to that, get to that. Isn't point. that interesting that if, if you murder or steal or burn down somebody's house, there's going to be a jury of 11. But when you deal with the government, it's going to be you and the IRS judge. And she's not going to tell it. She's not going to care that your cousin Eddie said it was tax deductible. Right. And you don't want to have to pay the cost that it's going to cost you to go to tax court. Yeah. So just remember, gang, everything is tax deductible until you go to tax court. And then it's you and Judge Judy, the IRS agent, and you're going to lose. So, hey, Craig, seriously, buddy, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come on my show and talk to all my homies about all things uh, CPA. I hope you get a client out of this. CraigCodyCompany.com. And also, seriously, from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you so much for serving uh, New York City 17 years on the street. I bet you had some scary times. I had a lot of fun. Mostly fun. <laughs> nah. what, what, what percent fun what percent scary and how about the boredom part and, and, and boredom yeah that's what the pilots all tell me they go they go flying a uh, uh, for Southwest Airlines is 99% boredom followed by 1% of sheer terror <laughs> I'll say one thing you know saving somebody 20 or 30 thousand dollars in taxes is a lot more exciting than chasing a perp down the streets in New York City <laughs> right on I'll agree with that Okay, and I'm sorry, being 100% Irish, I'm sorry for all the Irish drunks you had to put up with on the streets <laughs> of Manhattan for all those years. Even, no even the Irish know they drink too much, so I, I apologize on behalf of all Irishmen living in New York.
Have a Apologies great day, Craig. Accepted. Thank you very much for having me. I retired from the New York City Police Department after 17 years. In my days of a police officer of chasing perps down the street, it was adrenaline rush, and I get the same rush when I'm able to save somebody significant tax dollars. What I like best about our business is the fact that we're able to counsel people and help them realize their goals through tax planning. We became members of Certified Tax Coach and Tax Coach. Oh, it's a great community to be part of. I have a network of people throughout the country that I could tap into when uh, different clients' needs arise. It helps us keep our pulse on what's going on in the industry. Outside of work, I mean, it's all about family for me. Relaxing, traveling, um, boating members of a boat club nearby and we're able to leave the office, jump on a boat and go out, look at the beautiful Manhattan skyline and just relax. I like coming into work, I like interacting with our staff, I like clients, I like interacting with our team, I like to help people keep more of what they make.